Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Oranges Are Not The Only Fruit by Jeanette Winterson. So I'll read you the blurb here. Innovative in style, its humour by turns punchy and tender, Oranges Are Not The Only Fruit is a few days ride into the bizarre outposts of religious excess and human obsession. It's a love story too. Now, I don't normally like love stories, but there's just something in the way that this is written that I did enjoy, and also because it explores religion quite heavily, uh, specifically like British Christianity, which was something I was kind of surrounded with more as a kid than I am now. Uh, I went to like a Catholic school and had kind of religion forced on me, to be honest. But um, yeah, there's a lot of interesting themes covered here. I don't know what I would classify the genre as. I suppose it's like considered a modern classic literary fiction, that sort of thing. But yeah, let's just jump on in and uh, see what I made of it. So the first thing I want to mention here is um, this little bit here in the introduction that was written in 1991. But I, I just think this is quite an interesting thing to note. In 1985, Oranges was published thanks to the initiative of Philippa Brewster and her newly established Pandora Press. Sadly, Pandora has never had independent funding, and so it has been bought and sold and bought at the whim of its backers. In 1990, it became the property of Rupert Murdoch. How ironic that Oranges, thanks to a series of big business bungles, should fall into the hands of a self-confessed born-again multi-millionaire. I know that in an increasingly corporate world, it's getting harder and harder to make an ethical decision, either about the brand of baked beans you buy or the house with which you publish. The lines of choice are not clear-cut, and compromise is usually inevitable. For myself, I have a personal code of practice and stick to it as closely as possible. I decided that I could not leave oranges at Pandora. Dear Mr. Murdoch, please do not buy vintage. Amazing. All the different chapters in this as well are named after the books of the Bible, or some of the books of the Bible. thought this was interesting, helped to give a little bit of context here. And also it's weird because it's the second book I've read in a row that's mentioned corsets. Said uh, she was writing about her mother. Once, in winter, she had been forced to go there to buy a corset, and in the middle of communion, that very Sunday, a piece of whalebone slipped out and stabbed her right in the stomach. There was nothing she could do for an hour. When we got home, she tore up the corset and used the whalebone as supports for our geraniums, except for one piece that she gave to me. I still have it, and whenever I'm tempted to cook corners, I think about that whalebone, and I know better. I thought this was funny as well. She was she was playing with some felts, like some uh, of some animals, and... Um, so it says here, he smiled, let's put it right, shall we? And he carefully rearranged the lines in one corner and Daniel in the other. What about Nebuchadnezzar? Let's do the astonishment at dawn scene next. He started to root through the fuzzy felt looking for a king. Hopeless, I thought. Susan Green was sick on the tableau of the three wise men at Christmas and you only get three kings to a box. I thought this was funny as well. It's I'm, I'm not going to go into detail, but it's relevant to my life at the moment, I guess. I asked my mother to teach me French, but her flat face clouded over and she said she couldn't. Why not? It was nearly my downfall. What do you mean I persisted, whenever I could? But she only shook her head and muttered something about me being too young, that I'd find out all too soon, that it was nasty. One day, she said finally, I'll tell you about Pierre. Then she switched on the radio and ignored me for so long that I went back to bed. And uh, they got. there's another time she's at home with her mother and they've got the radio on and this happens. And now, said a voice, a programme about the family life of snails. My mother shrieked. Did you hear that? She demanded and poked her head round the kitchen door. The family life of snails. It's an abomination. It's like saying we come from monkeys. I thought about it. Mr. and Mrs. Snail at home on a wet Wednesday night. Mr. Snail dozing quietly. Mrs. Snail reading a book about difficult children. I'm so worried, Doctor. He's so quiet. Won't come out of his shell. Badum bum -tsh. I thought this was interesting, this little paragraph too. What could I do? My needlework teacher suffered from a problem of vision. She recognised things according to expectation and environment. If you were in a particular place, you expected to see particular things. Sheep and hills, sea and fish. If there was an elephant in the supermarket, she'd either not see it at all, or call it Mrs Jones and talk about pancakes. But most likely she'd do what most people do when confronted with something they don't understand. Panic. What constitutes a problem is not the thing or the environment where we find the thing, but the conjunction of the two. Something unexpected in an unusual place, our favourite aunt in our favourite poker parlour, or something usual in an unexpected place, our favourite poker in our favourite aunt. Just thought that was really well written. Good little use of the English language. There's also a story about a prince who was chasing perfection, and uh, he had a talking goose, I guess. Uh, prince, you're a fool, said the goose one day. What you want can't exist. It must exist, insist insisted the prince, because I want it. Logical fallacy there, but... So I want to read this. This is the story about what happened with Pierre. Well, I thought it must be love. 
But this puzzled her because Pierre wasn't very clever and didn't have much to say except to exclaim how beautiful she was. Then, on a quiet night, after a quiet supper, Pierre had seized her and begged her to stay with him that night. The fizzing began and as he clutched her to him, she felt sure she would never love another. Just really well written and one of those books that keeps you turning through the pages and I read it in like a day. So uh, yeah, would recommend. I gave it a 4.25 out of 5. So there we have it. That's what I thought of Oranges Are Not The Only Fruit by Jeanette Winterson. As always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that subscribe button for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.